too quickly, Sarah? Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> You're good now. <laughs> anyway, so David and Nehemiah are two people that remind us about the importance of prayer. And Nehemiah uh, has, has got one of the books of the Old Testament written about him. And um, we are talking about prayer today and how prayer comes into our planning. So if we could have the first slide, this, uh, for those of you who've been with us all these weeks, you'll know that we've been doing this series and we are up to number four, January 24th, on prayer. So let's just remind us about what the, what the Bible says about our plans. Proverbs 16, 9. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. James 4, 15 and 16. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans and all such boasting is evil. And then in that all-encompassing prayer that one of the um, uh, indigenous um, people um, mentioned also, in that prayer that we all know so well, the Lord's Prayer, we say, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it makes sense that if we are serious about our plans for this year, then we will invite the Lord to be part of that process. So let's start with Nehemiah the king, the king's cupbearer, somewhere around 500 BC. So the king was Artaxerxes, there will be a spelling test for those who can spell that <laughs> afterwards. King Artaxerxes uh, in, in the great Persian Empire. And the cupbearer was a bit like a bodyguard. He had to be highly trustworthy and loyal to the king because if somebody tried to poison the king, he was the one who would take the fall. But Nehemiah was an Israelite too. So he was working for a pagan king, and there is a number of people in the Old Testament, people of God, working in secular foreign situations. So it's not an unusual thing for Christians to be out in the secular world, working in secular jobs, but following God. And Nehemiah was one of those people. An Israelite, passionate for the things of God and his people, and well, what if someone could turn this pen off, please? Uh, yeah, passionate for his people and for God, and he heard that the city of Jerusalem was in ruins and that the worship of God was being prevented. He had a plan, a plan to go and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. That was a big plan. And there was a big problem associated with that plan. Uh, let's have a look at uh, the next slide. Uh, David, please. Number two. Trying to uh, negotiate a number of things today. I see open song, PowerPoint slides, videos. You did a great job, David. Fifty. Look, 50. it doesn't get easier after fifty, David. It's <laughs> a reminder. Yes, I realise. <laughs> Uh, 
I wouldn't persist with this, but in a moment we're going to have a Bible reading. The Bible reading's up there too. <laughs> and it's Got a it. good, ah, beautiful. Thank you. Well done. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, see, look, we would have missed out on this beautiful coloured map of the ancient world. So, this was the big problem that Eli had. So he was, he wanted to go back and help his people to build the city of Jerusalem. But he was over here in Susa, in, in Persia, which is now Iran, and here's Jerusalem. And guess how far that is? 1,600 kilometers. And this is, we're talking 2,500 years ago. There was no um, Boeing 707s and all that. <laughs> that was a long journey. And what's more, he's working for the king. He's got this most important job. How is the king going to let him go and do this kind of religious thing that is important to him, but to the king of Persia, it's just a little trivial, what, what's this about, you know? So what's Nehemiah going to do? He's got a problem. But Nehemiah commits everything to God in prayer. And so here we are, and Bernice is going to read this passage of Scripture and his prayer. This is Nehemiah 1, verses 1 to 11. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, I was at the fortress of Susa. Anani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, Things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. <coughs> when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the... O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people who rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. Thanks, Bernice. So Nehemiah prayed, and as you noticed, part of his prayer was he had to now front up to the king and say to the king, I need to get some leave for quite a substantial time so I can do what God has put on my heart. Well, he got his hearing with the king who accepted his request for leave uh, and for provision. He asked a bit more and then the king gave him even more. The king didn't, even, didn't just give him provision for the building works he had to do. He also gave him protection, sent part of his soldiers with him. So that was a fantastic answer to prayer. And so Nehemiah went and he organized the leaders and, and the people started work on the wall in Jerusalem. Later on, 
while they were doing that work, the work was going on over many months, while they were doing that work, they faced opposition to their building. Uh, because at this time, Israel was not just the land of Israel anymore, because they'd been in exile and they came back. And there was all sorts of other people living in the land who were not Israelites. And some of those opposed the people of Israel coming back and building their, uh, their, their cities again. So there was opposition. And here is one of the prayers, the Nehemiah prayers, about that opposition. Remember, O oh my God, all the evil things that Tobiah and Sambalat have done. And remember Noadiah, the prophet, and all the prophets like her, who have tried to intimidate me. He gives it over to God, and then he moves on. And when the wall was finally finished, the people have a great celebration of uh, thanksgiving to God for bringing their plans to fruition. And you can read about that in chapter 12 uh, from verse 27. Prayer was the natural thing to do for Nehemiah. King Solomon, when he was given the great responsibility of leading the kingdom after his father David, Pray this prayer. Uh, next slide, please, David. Right. Now, O oh Lord my God, you have made me king instead of my father David. But I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? Sometimes people block our plans. Uh, if you ask missionaries like Paul and Penny Wilcox or Mike and Catherine, uh, Catherine R. Catherine, they'll tell you about uh, bureaucracy and procrastination in countries where they work. Trying to get visas and other paperwork requires much patience and self-control and praying. And there are not always instant results, but they will tell you without hesitation that prayer is integral to how they live in those countries. David, both before he was king and also while he was king, was impeded by enemies. Most of us wouldn't be surprised at his incredibly honest prayers in the psalm, like this one, but I think you might still be shocked by this one. Psalm 109, parts of it. They surround me, this is David praying. They surround me with hateful words and fight against me for no reason. I love them. But they try to destroy me with accusations, even as I am praying for them. And brace yourself for this. Now remember, he's praying at this time, he's praying probably for a particular, about a particular enemy. Brace yourself. May his children wander as beggars and be driven from their ruined homes. May creditors seize his entire estate and strangers take all he has earned. Let no one be kind to him. Let no one pity his fatherless children. May all his offspring die. May his family, may his family name be blotted out in the next generation. So has anyone got enemies? Here's, here's how you can pray. No. No. There's an author, there's an author uh, called Kerry Newark, a Canadian uh, author and pastor. And he refers to this kind of prayer. And he says, this kind of honesty before God may actually help us to get perspective on a situation when our emotions are rocked to the core. See, just because it's in our Bible, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that God approves of this uh, expression, the way David's expressing himself. But what God doesn't disapprove of, sorry, that's a double negative. What God, 
uh, it is okay with is that is that you can express your uh, your emotions in prayer and a lot of faith if we don't have emotion and a heart in our faith then it, it becomes a kind of a, just a dry you know who wants that sort of faith but David was a man of passion and God is okay with David and all of us expressing these deep emotions because if we can express them in, our, in the privacy of our house or just as we are with God then they won't come out in bad behaviour and wrong attitudes to the people that we feel those emotions about. So prayer is, is something that is so natural and, and we need to learn to be honest with God because God is okay with it. And David was a great example of that. And what's more, sometimes expressing ourselves like that may be the first step towards forgiveness and even reconciliation with such people. So I basically come to the to the end of um, this message because I actually want to break up in small groups after our next song and um, pray in little groups and, and I'll tell you how we do that so don't get don't get worried about that. Um, we're going to do that in a way that it's going to work out. But I do want to bring, uh, just just make some points as 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 we uh, prepare to pray in a little while. I don't think that any of you would disagree about bringing God into the picture in all that we purpose this year. But sometimes we may feel that our prayers are stale, uh, that we are locked into a pattern of praying when when what comes out seems to be a bit cliché. Maybe that's why we don't come to prayer gatherings. But can I remind us again, and, and I shared this in an email uh, early in the week when I, when I wrote an email to the church. Um, Ephesians 6, 18, which is a passage that we all like because it talks about spiritual warfare, but in that same passage, it finishes with an exhortation to pray. And this is how it comes out in the Message Bible. In the same way, Prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. How important it is to pray, uh, not just for our own needs, uh, and, and wonderful that we can pray for our own needs and God lets us do that, but to pray for our brothers and sisters and pray look that so that no one falls behind or drops out and not only that that we pray for the world around us and pray for this world god tells us that we should be praying for the world we should be praying for kings we should be praying for leaders and we should be praying together we have opportunities before church every day we have a zoom prayer meeting on wednesday that's, that's just started up we have opportunities to gather together spontaneously you don't have to wait for a church leader to say you're going to have a prayer a meeting to, to pray with one or two people and do those sorts of things. We need to do this. God exhorts us to do this. And without prayer, we won't get to where we need to get to and where God is leading us to. Now, I just want to end this with some observations. So I was saying before, you know, some of us have been praying a long time and we're familiar with so many things and uh, sometimes those prayers get stale and sometimes you do get into a rut um, and and so you need to change and, and I think that the scriptures and even some of the things that we have seen today from these different um, these different great people of God in the Bible who were great people but also very broken people at times um, the way they prayed was fresh and passionate and um, there, there are no there are no great formulas uh, and we need to be honest in the things that we say you know uh, even in a prayer gathering we need to be honest uh, I, I really loved what Alan Parkin a few weeks ago 
we had a, a, an open prayer time, and uh, he got up and just prayed things that were on his heart. And I thought, wow, that, that was a really passionate prayer. And, and we need to learn to do that uh, in prayer and not feel like there are formulas and there's a certain ways of doing it. I was once again touched by uh, this lady, uh, Anna, who I've been telling you about a few times, who very slowly from a really kind of a wayward life uh, discovered God and just very slowly started to discover things about God. And um, one of them was about prayer. And I just, I, I just love this freshness. And, and this freshness helped me, I think, to be inspired again about not giving up in prayer. But listen to this freshness. As someone who doesn't even know what prayer is really, and she's just kind of just feeling away and, and getting to know it. The first time I prayed, I felt schizophrenic. I was alone in my apartment, tucked up in bed. Somehow, I had decided to speak rather bluntly to, to a divine being I could not see. My fear presented itself in two possibilities. Perhaps no one would hear me, showing I was either brainwashed or actually crazy. Or, possibly worse, I would discover there had been a person present my entire life, a person who loved me, fed me, and clothed me, whom I had neglected to even politely acknowledge. My previous contemplative <coughs> practice had been Eastern style meditation, an emptying of the mind and detachment from desire. Prayer, by contrast, seemed indulgent to me. Constant requesting of what I wanted was selfishness, was selfishness embodied. Yet, I knew that asking for help made a lot more sense than pretending I didn't need it. I had received no instruction or initiation about how to pray, and I had nothing to model my prayers on. Later, I would learn that most people are led in their first prayer to confess wrongdoing or invite Jesus to live in their hearts. I just wanted to talk to him. I sat in bed nervous. Well, if you are there, hello, how are you? I don't know what I'm doing. Is anybody out there? The air shifted and I knew all at once that there was. Suddenly, incredibly, there were two of us. It was not a monologue, it was a conversation. He was listening to me, and in a surge of grief, I felt my life spill to the edge of my lips. I'm sorry I haven't spoken to you in a while. There was no anger in the silence that followed, no distance. The other, whoever it was listening so closely to the brokenness of my heart, felt closer to me than anyone had been in my life. I stuttered, dumbstruck, unsure how to continue. It was as if every part of my false independence, every decision I had so confidently made alone, every explosive outworking of my dreaming, every mistake that had destroyed my understanding of self was resolved in that time, uh, one tiny surrender, the surrender of acknowledgement. It absorbed my defiance. I tested out my confidence with different prayers. Prayers for help with my continuing crush on Sam. Uh, I have a feeling, I haven't got to the end of the book, but I have a feeling that Sam was one of the first Christians that she met, might have been the one that she ended up that ended up being a husband, but I haven't got to that bit yet. <laughs> prayers. So my crush, she took, she prayed about a crush on Sam. Prayers to help me act, and then prayers to help me act when the director called action on the stressful television job. Prayers for forgiveness from the different people I had hurt, and she hurt many. As my lack tumbled out of my mouth, I released it. I felt the burden physically lift from me. Strange and immediate things started to happen. A prayer for inspiration in the play I was redrafting was met with a sudden desire to read a section of scripture, which then led to an entirely new scene. 
I prayed for my head cold and it vanished. I prayed about Sam and his distance from me and promptly received a call from him. I still felt guilt in praying for my own problems when I could have been praying for starving communities or wartime states, as though God had given me a, a million dollars and I was spending it on myself. But like a skittish and untrusting stray, suddenly bundled into an extravagant palace, I needed to test this overwhelming provision. I needed to know if I could trust him. Speaking to God exposed and unblocked me. I had dared to acknowledge that I was not alone and could no longer do it alone and the dam was now broken. I buried my face into his drenched shoulder and let my weakness, rejection and shame pour on out. I had invited in a help whose power I did not yet know. And when I read that, and I've read that a few times now, um, I just felt that that spoke to me and inspired me to keep going, to keep praying in my own life, to pray about my plans, to pray about those who are close to me, uh, to pray about my family, to pray about the things of church and the things of God, and to pray with other people. Because, and to, and to be ready to pray in ways that I don't even know about yet. Because prayer is a learning thing. You know, when, when the disciples asked Jesus to pray, that was a learning thing. And they kept learning how to pray. But that inspires me and I hope that maybe some of the things that I've talked about today and what we've seen about the, the great people uh, of God in the Bible will inspire you about your prayer life and bringing prayer into all that we do, into all your plans this year. We're going to sing a, a really well-known hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.